Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a great pleasure actually to rise to speak to the Governor General Bill. And unlike uh, the previous member who's just resumed to speak, I don't actually intend to, to waste the bulk of my contribution uh, rubbishing the importance of the Governor General's position or the necessity for this bill. And in fact, it's odd that Mr. Hughes spent so much time uh, ridiculing the need for this bill when, as he noted, it was in fact uh, the previous Labour government that, of course, uh, called for the Law Commission to investigate uh, the relevancy and, and the uh, appropriateness of, of that piece of the Civil List Act. As we've heard, sir, from the Prime Minister, the Law Commission has now reported, uh, and amongst its recommendations is that the Governor General uh, be governed, or the position of Governor General, be governed by a standalone piece of legislation, sir, which I think is appropriate, uh, and taking the opportunity, of course, to uh, modernise and update. Uh, those provisions. And as Mr Hughes said, the Prime Minister has run through a number of the technical provisions. Uh, but one of the things that I think is worth uh, touching on in the, in, the, in the current context that we all find ourselves in is, is this issue of tidying up uh, the transparency around the administration of the Governor-General's position. Because currently, sir, and it's not something I admit that I was uh, aware of until uh, looking into this bill, but up until now, uh, the Governor General, the Office of Governor General, was in fact paying for many of their official duties through what was loosely termed uh, the Governor General's personal allowance. Uh, and in the environment we find ourselves in, with intense scrutiny of spending of uh, taxpayer funds, and appropriately so, in my view, I think it is important actually that we carve out uh, from those allowances matters such as the holding of official functions, uh, and international travel that's undertaken at the behest of the government and ensure that that sort of funding is separately appropriated. Uh, in addition to clarifying that uh, spending through the Governor-General's officer, we will also see, uh, as part of the drive towards transparency, under this bill now an annual report to this House of Governor-General's expenses, which again, as I say, in the environment we have in particular media and public interest and scrutiny of spending, I think, sir, is a good thing and is certainly the direction that this House uh, has been moving in in general, and I know that uh, Governor-Generals will welcome that, uh, as they have uh, called for and are welcoming the removal of the income tax exemption. And in fact, sir, it's, I just wanted to comment that it's not just income tax that Governor-Generals up until now have been potentially exempt from. Uh, the legislation, in fact, provided a power to exempt Governor-Generals from any local tax, rates, fees, levies and the like, which harks back to the day when Governor-Generals were appointed uh, from Britain and were generally British residents, and it wasn't then, of course, appropriate for them to be paying taxes. But we've moved on considerably, sir, in the 160 years since our first Governor. We've moved on from the days of William Hobson. Uh, the Statue of Westminster, sir, of course, in 1931 meant that now Governor-Generals were simply the Queen's or the monarch's representative here, no longer representing the British Government. And, of course, since 1967, we've had New Zealand-born Governor-Generals, which, of course, is a step uh, in the right direction and certainly one that I think everyone would endorse. So now, sir, it is appropriate uh, that the highest office holder in the land is subject to income tax and all other taxes and charges that every New Zealander pays and contributes to the running of this country. Uh, and, sir, I support that. I also support, uh, as a matter of, of, of wrapping up my contribution, tidying up the rules around the payment of the annuity to a surviving spouse of a deceased Governor-General. Uh, it wasn't appropriate in this modern environment that that should be subject to restrictions such as not remarrying or not moving overseas. Uh, the spouses of Governor-General, sir, uh, play an important role. I think they're widely recognised for the work that they do. Uh, the current spouse is certainly in that position, as others have been, and I think there, there will be widespread support for ensuring that their annuity is not subject to some sort of uh, anachronistic uh, restriction on not remarrying and the like. So, sir, I think it's a timely bill, I think it's a worthwhile one, and I'm pleased, sir, to be able to commend it to the House. Thank you. I call